like many people around us, we've been talking about what do we do? Who will do it? How will we do it? In terms of what we see on the ground, now socially we are a certain way at the moment. We go to work, we get a job, we buy stuff from the local supermarket, and that's how things work. But if things are going to change, how are they going to change, and what do we do? In summary, what I'm about to share with you now goes as follows. A couple of years ago, on a big whiteboard, I put every single problem that we've got in front of us. Whether I agree with it or not, peak oil, finance crashes, climate change, etc., etc., etc. And there was about 18 of them. And each one was a column. And in each column, I put a series of outcomes of what I thought would be problems on the ground, what would happen. And what I realised, 99% of the time, those problems were actually the same. What that means is we can stop giving ourselves a hard time trying to second guess which problem is more relevant than another, and we can start getting on with the solutions. It also means if someone is absolutely committed to the idea of peak, peak oil, can now work together in lockstep with someone who's absolutely committed to the idea of hyperinflation or climate change. People who disagree fundamentally all of a sudden can work together without compromise. There'll be some discussion about who will do this, what part of society will actually help us, and then how. I'm going to use game theory in context of historical outcomes to show how we might do this. And then to add insult to injury, I'm going to put my model on the ground as a broad brush event-based timeline. This is not a timeline based in dates, as in Tuesday next week about tea time, you will see X, Y, Z. No, that, that hasn't worked. What I will do is we will see events in a certain order. What will they be? So, let's look at these problems. This is a, um, if done correctly, if you can actually get your head around what's actually happening here, it, it can actually liberate your thinking. But before we do, I'm going to sh share with you what I call the glass rod experiment. This is what I used to teach to undergraduate material engineers. We're going to take two glass rods. One, uh, this is like a swizzle stick in a lab. Glass has cracks on the surface because of the way it cools. So one is normal and the other has been dipped in acid. And the analogy is this. The glass rod's a system. One system has its normal checks and balances. The other system has had those normal checks and balances removed. And then I'm going to put it on this uh, a jig here with an, um, an arm across it and I'm going to put a bucket weighing it down and I'm going to see how much weight I can put on this system before it breaks. So this, this is the first glass rod. It breaks at a fairly low failure rate. The damage is much less, broken to two basic bits and it's possible to glue those bits back together and call it a glass rod. The system can be resurrected. The second system because it's had the normal checks and balances removed, it's taking a lot more strain. Have you ever seen a glass rod bend like that? Right, so when it does fail, it fails at a much higher stress rate, and the damage is complete. There's no way to glue all those bits together and call it a glass rod. The system is destroyed permanently. There's something in that for all of us. We take our modern world for granted. If it's too cold, we just turn up the thermostat. If it's too hot, we turn on the air conditioner. If we run short of milk, we think nothing of driving our car to the local supermarket to buy more. Dinner can be on the table in minutes with our microwave. We dress in the latest fashions, laundered by the newest superpower detergent in our five-cycle automatic washer. Merely flicking, flicking a switch lights the room and lets us listen to a concert in stereo and brings us the evening news live in colour from halfway around the world. It's really quite convenient. It may not always be so. I went around a couple of years ago and interviewed a lot of people who have actually been through these challenging situations. And there was one in particular who lived in Poland through World War II in the 30s and 40s. And 
they made some interesting observations that the modern generations, like anyone born past about, say, 1940, has become soft in the head. <laughs> now, that may be uncharitable, <laughs> but what it means is not only you've become fragile and flexible, we've become complacent as well. So, we're going to evolve. In terms of problem solving, though, what are we actually facing? Now, th this is the outcome of the next few slides. I'm going to show you the outcome first, because it's easier. What I noticed years ago is lots of people around me were focusing on problems, like they were separate. Like peak oil was talked about. And, and then, but mates of mine who were lawyers would say, no, 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 you've got to talk about hyperinflation. Peak oil's irrelevant. Or the, then you'll have guys who says, oh, it's all about climate change. You know, the rest of you guys are idiots. Right. Some people would go focus on, uh, if we had better politicians, all of this would have been solved. We've got to get someone else. Some people would go straight towards the inappropriate civilization profile. We need to become greener. We need to be more sustainable. And some people would go straight to the population overshoot debate. And some of us would also, uh, what I call the conspiracy theory window, shadow leadership is the problem. But in terms of what we see on the ground for all of those, is these bottom two lines. Rolling shortages of groceries, large-scale natural disasters, shortages of petrol, legal restrictions, breakdown and removal of civil utilities like water and sewerage. That's what we plan for. All of these things are part of the same thing. Whether you agree with them or not, it's your choice. But they can be seen as part of the same animal, where they're the fundamental root causes and they're the on-the-ground consequences. So once you actually sort of start thinking in terms of that, what do we do with all this stuff? What I used to do to my students is if they're doing a PhD or something, what I would make them do is get their problem that they're working on and get it onto a single page, a single image, whatever that is, a graphic, a series of dot points, a sentence, whatever they wanted to do. So here goes. Too many people in the caring capacity of the local global environment, local and global, in a society that's hopelessly dependent on non-renewable, finite natural resources, where how they use those resources is extraordinarily wasteful and inappropriate. I'm sure this will end well. Now, if you read certain luminaries like Jared Diamond or David Attenborough, uh, they've studied various cultures of societies that have, that have hit existent, existential um, crises, and they've all come up with a series of causes. And our modern society, which is industrially based, has these problems as well. Now, the takeaway message from that, some of those societies did survive, and those that did not. The ones that did came down to these red lines here. The society has to, en masse, understand the nature of the problem in front of them, and en masse, they have to have a response to those problems. If those that didn't do that, or if, not, if enough of the society didn't do that, they collapsed. So my question to you, is what's our response to our current problems? I'd put it to you that we're seeing willful ignorance and give war a chance. So I believe we're going to crash. Right, how will that work in network theory? This is the way we are now. Highly centralised. We're administered from very far away. Unbalanced, high energy, high tech, but unsustainable. And we're going to grade into a system that is low energy, low tech, and sustainable. But it's balanced. It has to be. If it's not, it will evolve into one through necessity. In between, we're going to have a transitionary period where the current paradigm will fight for its own survival. High risk, class warfare, and necessity only. And it's going to be very, very pooey. Now, once we actually get to the new system, we will look at developing and recovering some things that we take for granted now, like education or technology. And so we're talking about a balanced, high-tech society that's sustainable. I'd put to you that's, that's a couple of hundred years away. That's, a, that's, that's hard work. Now, this talk today is about this bit here, the, the new system. The conspiracy theory window could be uh, modelled by the transition phase here. And something like the Venus Project put out by the Zeitgeist uh, community would be the full recovery. But that's not going to happen next week. So now let's talk about who. 
Lots of people do believe that they don't need to do anything at all because the government will save them. We don't need to do anything. This is why we vote for them. This is why we have a government. So let's look at that. The governments today, they're a system like anything else. They're utterly dependent on institutions and utilities to function. Water, sewerage, power. They need finance and credit. The just-in-time supply grid. They need the petroleum network to function. And they're dependent on infrastructure and existing paradigms. Their modus operandi is structured around the idea of reliable communications grid and ease of transport over long distances. But they do have a mandate to respond to emergencies, so they'll do their level best. And we have seen them do that in the last couple of years with things like flood and fire. But they don't have the resources to deal with macro problems, large-scale problems over a wide region. There comes a point where they just run out of money, run out of resources, and they become overwhelmed. But they will problem-solve in a triage fashion according to the current paradigm. And they'll think in terms of continuity of government for its own survival. It has to. That's its mandate. Now, what it means is it will go missing for periods. Six, eight weeks at a time, services will be withdrawn. A lot of people believe that the corporate sector is the solution. Big government's the problem. If we didn't have a government, the free market will sort it out. Let's look at that. The conventional corporate sector is just as dependent on institutions to function. Have you noticed that big government and big corporate profiles are indistinguishable? As in, they're the same. They need the same things to operate. They're fragile. The corporate culture is fragile. The moment there is a problem, right, the moment their market withdraws, they're insolvent. And if they're in debt at the time, they go under. Each corporation, though, operates in isolation. They don't care where their inputs come from, and they don't care where their market goes, as long as someone's there to buy their stuff. That's the way they're geared socially. Now, they're dependent on the market to make a profit from. Someone needs to be able to pay them, and that system needs to be in place for them to be viable. They're not able to proactively meet any solution, which it, that, that might mean the end of their own paradigm. Anyone that suggests they do something that actually costs them money or threatens their business model, it ain't going to happen. Conventional problem solving, and this is not so much a theory as an observation, starts with brutal self-interest. And then it moves on to fragmentation or mass layoffs. We're seeing that now. And ends in irrelevance when that corporation goes out of business. And so they won't be able to function. And they'll be too preoccupied with their own survival to help the people on the ground. If they're in a stressful situation, why would they help people that's outside their business model? That's their thinking. So who? Government will be overwhelmed, corporate sector won't be able to function, but the people on the ground have the flexibility and capability to respond once they've changed their thinking. Historically, this has been the case. Every time there's an emergency, facilities stop. People on the ground adapt in some form. It's not pretty, it's not easy, but that's the way it goes. Now, the work that is required for self-sufficiency is too much for most individuals. There are exceptions to that rule. Um, and a single household even is going to be difficult. But a community of, say, 30 to 40 households can respond and could be resilient to meet these issues. Right? And I talk about how we actually sort of get to that point. That's about the level we're going to. That's the new social unit of, uh, of work. What this means, it was always going to be us. People at the grassroots level. Who's going to save us? We will. Now, when people in, in mass get it and they start to look to each other, what do we do? The people who are thinking about this now have the luxury to think things through and they don't necessarily have to panic. So they will be the leaders. And who are those leaders? The sort of people who might come to a presentation like this. So if you want your leaders, look around right now. It's you guys. There are people like you all over the world. They've been talking about this, they've been negotiating this, and they've been working out what to do for decades. So if it does, what do we do? First, we've got to decide who we are and what kind of world do we want to live in. Very important. Before we start any work at all, what kind of world do we want to live in? 
And then there'll have to be certain examination of what we're doing at the moment, and certain things will have to go. Now we're conditioned to believe we're helpless. We can't do anything. It's not possible. Ordinary people, though, always rise to the occasion. History makes it so. It won't necessarily be very pretty or very comfortable, but the outcome will be something like that. The most difficult, the significant task in front of us is, an, is a revolution in perception and a restructuring of social responsibility. We're going to change socially. All this stuff about energy and stuff is great, but it pales into insignificant of what we as a culture must become. And what we think does matter. How we think, what we think on, what do we spend our time on. This is the old energy flows where attention goes. If we spend our time considering what the problems are, and only considering what the problems are, on the day when, when the balloon goes up, we'll know the problems well but we won't have any idea of what to do with regard to the solution. If you want to spend your energy effectively, look at the solutions and get on with it. Now, in the world that's coming, and this is something that really did uh, upset me at the time when I understood this, the educated will be merely learned, completely unprepared for what's required. Learners will carry the day. I went to school for 22 years, multiple degrees. Sounds impressive. But in this context, most of it's actually not that useful. So, it doesn't matter necessarily what you are now, rather what you might do. Having lots of useful stuff is great, but it's insignificant compared to what's between your ears, in your heart, and in your hands. Flexibility in your ability to respond effectively, that's what you need to look at. And that comes down to a personality type. So now that we've looked at that, let's start the process of problem solving. And everyone's different. I'm just going to sort of put to the, what I went through a couple of years ago. We're looking at a civilization changing, society-wide shift from our current paradigm. And we're going to change a worldview based on a short-range consumerist whim to when we intelligently take stock of what's necessary. Once we finish the shouting, there's going to be a great deal of whinging, bitching and moaning about what's going to happen, who's going to fix it. Give you a stereo. Once we've finished with that, we've got to work out what we're going to do. And it'll require a complete shift of attitudes and assumptions. And we're going to shift away from, at the moment, the individual household is perhaps the base unit of our current society. And we're going to shift to a village or a group of houses. And we have to evolve past some of our unproductive habits and we'll have to revalue and reprioritize everything. What something costs, what it's worth, what we want, what we need, what we can do without, what we must do without. Now, everyone has to go through this as well. It's a very personal thing, so it, it, and it's different for each of us. What's in your life at the moment? What do you do? Where do you do it? How do you do it? And why do you do it? And what do you currently consider necessary? versus a luxury? And what are the major aspects of your life and how do they work? And your non-negotiable costs, things you can't do without. Are you paying a mortgage? Do you rent? Are there rates involved? Do you require pharmaceutical medication? Transport, can you walk to work? Or do you need a bus? Are you in a car? And dependents, who are you responsible for? Pets, most people don't consider pets I promise you, if you've got a pet cat and you like your pet cat, on the day you want to give that pet cat some of your food. It's a plan for it. <coughs> that depends on who you're married to. Um, now, in all those things, start thinking about how you might restructure everything like that against the backdrop of perceived problems. Now, you have to understand the nature of what's coming. And, you, and that helps you with you, what sorts of things would you need to see before you can say, society's normal, we can get back, to, get back to work. We don't have to worry about it anymore. We don't have to talk about things like population overshoot or peak oil anymore. It's all good. It's sorted. Understand what you must see. And then understand how society might change. And if it does, where would you fit in? 
and take each issue, identify it, and game theory on what might happen. This is what I did. What I meant, though, is you take a historical example, a known historical example where a problem happened, like Cuba, 1990, the Soviet Union collapsed, and oil was withdrawn as a supply. What happened? Known timeline, known events. Place yourself and your family in that situation as if you lived there. Map known events and known timelines to develop possible solutions. And in each historical case, understand what you would have had to have done to maintain the survival of your family as if you were there. Now you can do that with any historical situation. Russia as it collapsed. Bosnia. Chechnya. Argentina. Pick your poison. Now, so let's look at some of these problems. Let's pick, say, financial meltdown. And we're going to look at, say, Zimbabwe 2008 and Germany 1923. Imagine if, say, FPOS froze. We had a credit freeze. You couldn't use your card anymore and no cash was issued. Right. There's a point to this. The outcomes were, in this case, hyperinflation. Money became worthless. Utilities crashed and the government withdrew services. The economy disintegrated and most goods became unavailable and the harsh language index went up. And they saw all these problems. Shortages of petroleum, no money, shortages of groceries, breakdown of civil utilities, law and order became a problem, and severe legal restrictions of what was allowed was enforced by the government of the day. People on the ground, what did they do about it? Well, first they had to become socially flexible. They had to very quickly learn who they could depend upon and who they could not depend upon. And that was a very, very important step. They had to become as self-sufficient as possible on the household property scale. Low-profile problem solving. Don't shout from the rooftops that you've got stuff that everyone else wants. Grow your own food, collect your own drinking water, manage your own sewerage. Trade became barter-based. I'll give you this if you give me that. That comes back to who you can depend upon. Energy and transport needs were cut to a bare minimum. You had to manage your own health needs and educate your children yourself. That's what they did. <coughs> Degradation of society in general breakdown. Let's look at Argentina, 2001. Rationing and curfews. Breakdown of utilities. The government withdrawal of services. Water, power, sewerage all went offline for, for months at a time. The economy disintegrated and most goods became unavailable. There were food riots and civil unrest and the harsh language index went up. And they saw all these problems. Petroleum products, no money, rolling shortage of the groceries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, same sort of problems. Their solutions were very similar. Be socially flexible, self-sufficient, low-profile problem solving, grow your own food, collect your own water, manage your own sewerage. Barter became very important. Reduce energy needs and transport needs. Manage your own health, and educate your own children. Peak oil. Cuba, 1990. Soviet Union collapsed. Oil service is cut. Petroleum products are severely rationed. Money became worthless. The average wage was about $1.50 a week, which was not worth anything to anyone. So money as a social institution was overturned, and they had to find something else. Utilities crashed, but because this is one of the few success stories, they had to fundamentally reinvent themselves. The conventional economy disintegrated and was had to completely restructured. And most manufactured goods were unavailable and new services came online. And they saw those problems. Very similar. What did they do? Socially flexible. Adjust their needs. Know who to depend upon. Self-sufficient at the household property. They assisted in society's transformation. Everyone stepped up. Yes, there were problems. But in large, people got it. They understood what they had to do. Grow your own food, collect your own water, manage your own sewerage. Barter trade became the money. Reduce energy and transport. Dispose of rubbish carefully and educate your own children. The difference here was effective leadership from government and the people on the ground understood what was needed and they got behind their government. Everyone understood, and everyone started pulling in the same direction. Climate change. Now we get nasty. My model for climate change is unconventional. I have multiple components to it. Climate change is what we see in terms of weather, but Earth changes are things like earthquakes, sinkholes, 
tears in the magnetic field, that ha what have you, structural changes to the planet, we're seeing both. And I have a model of why that is, and it's not conventional. The human-generated component comes down to a system. What I ended up picking for this one was the eruption of Mount Thera in Crete in 1450 BCE. One of the, a big volcano blew its top and ash covered all the flora and fauna and made water very acidic. Food crops were destroyed and Crete was subject to a series of large-scale natural disasters and there is a theory that this is why the Minoan civilization broke apart. They saw those problems. What do they do? Socially flexible, know who to depend upon, become self-sufficient, spend serious time and resources replenishing the local environment. Be prepared to use unconventional methods to grow, grow and gather food. Now, in this environment, most people just simply moved. Too hard, let's go to another island. Uh, what happens if the whole planet does this and you can't move somewhere else? Political instability. Poland, 1938. Germany, 1935. Rationing curfews and social upheaval. Radical changes of what is legal. Movement and consumption heavily controlled and the economy disintegrates and most goods are unavailable. And they saw all of those problems, everything except climate change. What did they do? People got through it, they became socially very flexible. They adjusted what they needed very, very quickly. Self-sufficient, in a brutal kind of way. Low profile problem solving became very important. Grow your own food, collect your own water, manage your own sewage. Barter-based trade. Trust between people was very important. Reduce energy, reduce transport, dispose of your own rubbish very carefully, manage your own health and educate your own children. Population overshoot. Here's the classic. I'm sure you've seen this before. Easter Island. Resource depletion in a system small enough that everyone's accessible to everyone else. Resource wars and social upheaval, shortages of everything, and problem solving too little, too late. Population dropped from 15,000 to about 3,000 over a 700 year period. It wasn't fun. And they saw everything. Uh, the equivalent of energy instead of petroleum, but the, everything that, that made this society possible became a problem. Socially flexible, no to depend upon, self-sufficient, low profile, problem solving, grow your own food, collect your own drinking water, manage your own sewerage. Problem was, everyone was accessible to everyone else. So they gave war a chance instead. Scarcity and resource wars lead to an inevitable outcome when no one wins. And forming a community is not possible in a toxic social environment. And problems in a finite system have to be faced, not ignored. Now, this is one of the societies that hit their challenge and they weren't able to keep it together and it failed. That's the sort of thing that you have to come to terms with. The network of problems we're actually looking at the moment, it is, uh, the difference between when action is possible and when action is irrelevant is very narrow. It's not possible yet, as the current system is still working. So what you do in that window, what we do, makes the difference between Cuba and Easter Island. In common, across all those, there was about 18 uh, um, possible problems to model, and I looked at about 30-odd historical circumstances. And this is basically what was 99% across the board. Be socially flexible, adapt, know your environment, know who to depend upon, become self-sufficient at the household property level, assist in society's transformation. If you don't, no one else will. Low profile problem solving, that being said, grow your own food, collect your own drinking water, manage your own sewerage, develop a barter network, Reduce energy to a bare minimum. Dispose of rubbish carefully. Is it really rubbish? Manage your own health needs. Transport. Cut to a minimum. Educate your children yourself. Spend serious time and resources replenishing the local environment. Land stewardship. You can't leave. You have to make do with what you've got. Now, all of these problems that we looked at, they were temporary. They last a couple of years. But what happens if they're not temporary? New systems will be put in place to meet those needs through unconventional means. Social change. So, I'm putting forward the following set of ideas. There's two scales of thinking that will happen simultaneously. First is the household. 
You must become, at your household level property, self-sufficient or as close to it as you can. And how might your current tra household transform to become resilient? And we'll talk about that later. At the same time, or a little bit after, households will come together. Because there's a lot of work to be done here. A single household will find it difficult, but several, a number of them together can do it. So how might your family retrain into a useful job in this environment and interact with your community in a way that's perceived, underlined, to be needed? This is my plan. Luxury of having a couple of years to think about this. I live in a farm where organic uh, food is grown, and this is my horse TJ, and I'm learning the art of horse and carriage. And the plan is to not bother with mining anymore and transport food and vegetables around my local community. And I'm in the process of rebuilding that cart into something more practical that can carry people slash cargo. So let's look at some of these practical solutions. We now have a list. And we know who's going to do it. So what are we going to do? Before we get into that, I'll talk to you briefly about food stores. At the moment, we have what's called a just-in-time supply grid. A uh, hundred years ago, your average warehouse had six to eight months' worth of supplies in it before there was a problem. At the moment, we have a couple of days, because that's the way we are set up economically. The NMRA released a report in February 2013 uh, in terms of, well, what's in our system. In terms of dry goods, what's down in your supermarket? Nine days, according to normal conventional consumption. Chilled and frozen goods like milk, milk, butter, cheese, seven days. Hospital pharmacy supplies. If you uh, have a problem and you need to go to hospital, three days supply. Retail pharmacy, seven. But the ugly one is fuel. Petrol has three days supply in normal uh, normal consumption rates. Now, every time there's a problem, and we saw this, say, when there was a flood or, or, or a fire, there's a run on groceries, and that gets cleaned out pretty quick. So, I would recommend, it, it's, not, it's not my place to tell you what to do, but I would recommend that there is a need for storages and supplies, especially food, to buffer for this kind of variability in your garage. And if there is a fuel disruption event, which is quite probable for Australia, because our oil comes from the Middle East and it's processed in Singapore, and there'll be food shortages within weeks. And you can either moan about it then, or you can have something in place now. Resilience, the capacity to withstand shocks, is very much about buffers. The system and the storage of food, fuel, water is a very important part of that. Now, most households have about a week's food in the cupboard. What comes down to maybe one pay cycle. Ideally, and this sounds pretty scary, but one year of food supplied under carbon dioxide so it's less likely to go off. Three to six months is probably a more practical number. Think about it, have something. Now, this is about buying yourself a learning curve. If you're going to grow your own veggies, it takes months to set up a garden and get the soil balance right. And then you need to plant, assuming you've planted at the right time. And assuming everything goes well, two to three months later, you start producing results that you can eat, right? And that's providing everything goes okay. So what are you going to do for those two to three months? Right, this is the transition we're facing. Power, electricity. This is the defining part of our current system. Power. <coughs> All our power tools, a lot of our equipment, a lot of our technology requires electricity. The existing system is very fragile and vulnerable in its current form. And in fact, even just the storms we're having and the floods, it's a bit hit and miss to keep a reliable, clean supply. It's dependent on delicate parts manufactured far from here. Once we start having peak energy, do you really think they're going to be shipping parts out from China at the rate they do now? Delicate electronics like computers require what's called pure sine wave power. The reason brownouts are a problem and power spikes is they're very, very, very disruptive to things like computers. Rolling blackouts and brownouts, power spikes will be the norm, and say power dropouts are six, eight weeks at a time. That's the polite version of what we're grading into. And 
and as things get more difficult, the government will not be able to maintain the grid to the same standard it does now, and will probably contract in size. Services will be withdrawn from regional areas. It will be harder and harder and harder for that government to maintain that power grid in a city. The power grid will probably contract around services like a tertiary hospital. They kind of do that now. You, they, you never see a blackout around a hospital. Most electrical equipment is not made to last and will quickly degrade, more so in that environment. And so standalone power systems are now required. Most solar panel systems sit on the roof and have no battery support. And here's the point. Most, what we need to do is reassess what power is needed. How often do you see walking down the street we're using power to light the streets or lights are left on? We, are, we waste power because it's cheap and it's abundant and we don't need to worry about such things. That'll be reassessed. Solar power is what everyone normally thinks about. Now, if you were to remove fossil fuels, take coal, gas, oil off the grid, and if you were to make solar panels as the solution to all of that, how many solar panels would you have to make? Never mind where you put them and how you manage them. How would you make them? Because I put it to you, we don't have the metal or the minerals in the ground to do so. However, it has its place. Systems, though, require a battery bank of sufficient amp hour capacity to handle both your input and output needs. And you need to develop the capability to make solar panels and batteries locally. They're made in factories in Taiwan at the moment. We need to be able to make them down the road. Wind. Unreliable, hit and miss, but it's easy. You could knock up one of these in a garage. Uh, this is a windmill down the road from where I live. Uh, it's useful, it's noisy, and you can repair it, and it's probably one of the solutions we should probably look at. Biogas. Uh, we haven't got to this section yet, but we're probably going to see more livestock around us. And then there's human generated wastes as well. Now, there are health problems associated with leaving too much manure around. But if you were to, and it's smelly, I know, I've got a horse. Uh, if, if you were to collect that uh, manure, human and livestock, and if you were to convert it into energy, it would solve several problems at once. They do it in India, they do it in China, in regional areas, it's entirely possible. Hybrid power systems are probably the way to go. Every, every household probably won't have a power system but you're looking at, say, a windmill and a solar panel array feeding into a battery bank. Generators are all the rage and everything, but I, I think they're uh, not the solution. If you've got a generator and you want to, say, run uh, power to your refrigerator, your jerry can of fuel will last a couple of days at most. What are you going to do after that? If you're going to have a generator, save the power for something useful like running power tools to manufacture your new system, whatever that is, with the idea that getting hold of fuel will be difficult. If you do have a generator, get a diesel one. Yes, they cost more, but the, the implications of peak oil mean diesel will be around for longer than petrol because of the processing steps. Now, the household. How does the household become self-sufficient? What would the ideal capabilities be? Grow your own food, veggie garden, chicken run, a compost heap, if you can do it, a milking cow. Now having a cow is very problematic. If you can do it though, you've got a tradable resource. If you just happen to have a bit of pasture out the back. A water tank, get off centralised water power. Have a water tank on a stand, if it's on a stand it can be gravity fed. And have a way of pumping that water around that doesn't need power, hand pump for example. Sewerage, an old fashioned septic system. A compost toilet is probably the most efficient way of doing this. And a grey water system to actually use some of the water that comes off, say, your, your, your cooking and laundry. Household cooking without electricity. We'll get to that in a sec. Uh, the way they used to do it was a, a wood stove range and an open fire hearth. That is very difficult to set up in the modern home. But if you happen to have a barbecue with a full gas bottle, full, F-U-L-L, -L, um, you can transfer your cooking onto that. Refrigerator, how do you make a, a fridge without power? You can do what's called a Kalgoorlie fridge by wrapping Hessian, uh, Hessian material around a couple of uh, sticks and soaking it in water, or you can make a 
uh, earthenware pot within a pot, which we'll talk about later. Washing machine. If you can't run your washing machine, wash your clothes in a bucket. Communications. If you can maintain power, keep your computer running because it's an information resource. After that, in terms of emergency services, have a battery radio, battery powered radio so you can listen to broadcasts. And your old fashioned landline telephone that you plug into the wall can run without power because there's enough power down the phone line. Transport. Well, as cars go offline, have a good set of walking shoes, a bicycle. If you do have a vehicle, have a diesel one. And the horse culture is all around us. How many pony clubs are around us? They're all around us. It, it, it's, it's part of my solution, but it will surprise you how many horses are around us now. Rubbish. What do we call rubbish? And is it really rubbish? Recycle it. Use it. And the stuff you can't use, in the 70s in Queensland, we had incinerators in every backyard where we burned the rubbish. We return to that. Lighting, either go without light, candles, gas and oil lanterns or LED lights, and the workshop. If you've got practical skills, use them. And if you can do it, have hand tools that don't need electrical power to do it. But power affects all of that at the moment. So you're going to have to rejiggle that so maybe you don't need power. And if you do want power, there are your options. What's interesting is, in terms of transport, people say, oh, we need to go to an electric car. We've got to design and build one. But if you, if you play golf, I live next to a golf course. One, one day my horse broke out of my property and went clomping across this golf course. And while I was running after him, I saw all these golf carts ducking for cover. Right? And, uh, and, and I realised... They're functional electrical cars that can be charged off the, off the grid that are small and reliable. The technology's already done. A golf cart. All right. General stores that you can draw upon. And this might be a personal failing, but I do like my books. Socially, how do we interact in this new environment? At the moment, there are no easy answers. Our current ways of doing this just can't do it. So we've got to evolve really, really quickly. And if we don't want to descend into chaos, we need to think about it and at least get it half right. In a system terms, we lived in socio-ecological systems. Socially, we interact, but we also interact with our environment. They're not separate. And here's a bit of jargon, but I'm going to hit you with it anyway. These are nested, complex, adaptive systems in emergent properties and feedbacks that can change system behaviours. So we need to understand how some of that works. And no matter how, what that means is, no matter how well individuals adapt, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter if you're a hero individually. How we come together collectively into communities really has to be looked at. And you've got to address things like, what do we call a universal harm or a universal interest? What are the benefits of working together versus going it alone. And that conversation has to be had. For those of us who actually seriously think about it, going it alone will only get you so far. But society at large has to understand that, because that's the first thing we'll try. We have to agree on how we do all this. And it requires to manage on the fly. And there's no, there's really no easy way to do this. A friend of mine, Neil Davidson, is part of a group that's actually looking at this. And this is what he calls it, co-designing new systems of social governance. That's his particular contribution to this. Sounds complicated, but we really do have to do it. This may well be happening in a brutal practicality manner in less than a second, through necessity. Or if we're smart, we can discuss it years ahead of time. Now. In all the books you read about this, they say, form a community. Hurrah. Now what? There's generally a single sentence, form a community, and then you've got to move on to the next topic. And so I gave a bit of thought about what would that community actually do? And I came up with this. We'll have a series of local village councils, each representing a geographic area small enough for people to walk to meetings in a practical sense. So you're not going to have a community of Adelaide where everyone comes together. Each street will have, or each neighbourhood will have a community. And that community will be attended by people who live there. Having ring-ins from the next suburb over might upset people. And that community will have a mandate. They will decide who, what needs to be done, who will do it, where will it be done, 
Who benefits from the outcome and what community assets will be used? And in terms of tasks, that's the sort of things they'll do. Land stewardship, they've got to manage that. They've got to decide what to do. Community scale crops and community scale secondary products will have to be managed. Construction of community assets, like sheds. Dispute resolution and communication with other communities. That's a basic framework. How do we do it? Now we, people are saying, how do we actually get to this point? Now what we were actually talking about in Mount Tambourine was, uh, we picked the 100 elders in the community of say 10,000 people, about 100 people were decisive in what everyone else thought. So if we could reach those 100 people and get them to think in a certain way, when the shit hits the fan, everyone will watch what they do. And if they get it, they'll know what to do and they'll be able to make suggestions. Everyone's got shovels, for example, in gardens and garden rakes. You can say, well, the day after food stops coming to the supermarket, a thousand people pick up a shovel, as long as they know what to do with it. It will happen very quickly. The time when action is even possible is not here yet, but the window between action is possible and action is irrelevant is really narrow. But that's how you stack the deck. You find your community leaders now and you quietly talk to them. So things can evolve very, very quickly. Society will decide who they are and what kind of world they want to live in very quickly. So, a series of houses will come together. It's a nice picture, the real thing won't look anything like that, of course. Um, you'll have a group of houses. And if you walk around suburbia at the moment, if you don't bother driving cars anymore, how much parkland do you see? How big are your footpaths? The green median strips between roads, roundabouts. What are you going to do with all that stuff? Right, it'll be cultivated, just like in Cuba in 1990. Have passport, will travel. So food. Let's get into some of these things. Food. The key to a community's health comes down to the quality of its food source. And it needs to be completely organic. You're not going to be able to buy any industrial herbicides anymore. So you've got to do it yourself. Land stewardship is very important. You can't crap up your local environment. You can't leave. It's going to be very difficult to move on. So you've got to take care of your own paddocks in a sustainable fashion. It's no good growing veggies for two years in a row only to find you can't do it anymore. You've got to be sustainable across a generation or two. And that involves a balance between growing fruit and vegetables and livestock and uh, allowing sand, uh, soil and land to recover effectively and sustainably and all that stuff. Managing the seasons and planting calendars, the difference between planting in winter versus planting in spring. If you don't know it now, you certainly will. Seed saving. Sounds easy, but it's a real pain in the you know what. And it, all of it's based on soil health. And nutrition will be more important than ever before because everyone has to work in a physical context. Food preservation, canning and meat smoking will all be important skills. And those skills are actually around us now. And those people who still remember how to do it have to teach everyone else. Now, at the household scale, there's two scales, household and community. What are we going to do in terms of fruit and veggies? Well, people on the property only. Appropriate land stewardship. What I mean by that, tree, uh, tree planting, making a fertiliser and applying it. Companion planting of your crops. Appropriate planting cycles. Carrots followed by pumpkins, followed by whatever. They each strip, strip minerals out of the soil and put minerals in. If you can work out how that works, planting in a certain <coughs> order, land stewardship becomes easier. OK, so you're going to have a veggie garden and maybe a chicken run. All your food scraps can feed the chickens. Fruit trees. Now, all the stuff that comes off this stuff, you've got to preserve it somehow. If you have six months worth of oranges come off the tree in one, one hit, most of it will rot, unless of course you preserve it in some form. And then you need to store it, and you need to keep track of what you preserved and when, so it doesn't go off. Herb garden. Not just useful for cooking, natural medicine, and a dairy cow. Having a cow is a lot of work and requires infrastructure, but if you can manage it, 
you've got a source of fertiliser and you've got a source of dairy products which is tradable. And all of those things have waste products which have to go into something like a compost heap or a worm farm which goes back to fertiliser. And over all of it, you've got your water management system. Your water tank, your grey water system, your septic uh, tank, if you've got one, will flow onto a reed bed. You've got an irrigation system and you've got a way of pumping water around that doesn't need energy. But at the community scale, you've got the same things but at a larger scale. Land stewardship, bigger scale food crops, uh, you've got long-term soil health, tree trimming. Try and, cut a, try and actually do a bit of tree trimming without a chainsaw. It can be done, it, but this requires a bit more uh, tenacity. Community scale vegetable crops on vacant land. If there's not going to be a council to argue with you anymore, you can start producing large scale crops that's not necessarily on your property. Herbs, fruit and nut trees, tracking of seasons, beekeeping. If someone can keep a beehive, not only will you have honey, but everything around you will just grow better. In the States at the moment, they're actually having a lot of problems because beehives are dying off. And in Europe, they've linked that to the use of industrial herbicides. So all of that is going to have waste products that are going to feed into fertiliser. And if you've got vacant land, you can start looking at having cattle on that land, which you've got to do, prep, um, we'll get to cattle in a sec. So all the stuff that comes from that has got to be processed and preserved and canned and stored. You can make dairy products or secondary food products in, like say cooking oil. And all of this is great if you've got a team of people to come together. If you've got 10 people doing this, it's easier. If you've got one person doing this, it's very hard. And so it's got to be stored somewhere where everyone's got access to it. And you've got to keep track of who's done what and where. And you've got your water management system over all of it. And it all has to balance. And it's to be administered by the people in that community. Good luck actually trying to insert yourself into one of these if you're not there already. That's what I'm saying. The community itself will form. And when they will, it will form in terms of an identity. This is our land, our community, our village. And through necessity, we all will do it. Livestock. Right. Vacant land. Parks. And you can have one community that does one thing, like you run livestock, and the next community over makes soap, or the next community over makes vegetables, and then you trade with each other. Beef, sheep, goats, pigs. And if you're going to do breeding, you've got to look at containment of things like the, the ghost, uh, billy goat or the, or the bull or what have you. Now, I run a, a, with my, my wife runs a breeding lodge and we um, had a couple of stallions and I promise you containment of that stallion is different to just containment of horses. Different animal. Land stewardship. This is slightly different, but you've got paddock rotation. You must prevent overgrazing. We had lots of problems with the grass being overgra uh, overgrazed and the weeds recovered before the grass. And so very quickly we had a paddock of weeds that the horses wouldn't eat we had, so all of a sudden had to buy hay. Noxious weed control. Manure management. You can't leave the manure in the paddock. You've got to pick it up. Otherwise, the animals won't graze there. Seasonal cycles. The difference between grass growing in winter versus spring. Long-term soil health and pasture quality. Very important. Infrastructure. We're now talking fences and paddocks and sheds to keep gear in. If you can have an electric fence, life's a lot easier. Containment yards, water troughs, you need a way of getting water. If you've got to carry water, enough water for say a horse or a cow to drink, by hand, you'll be thinking meat and sausages very quickly. If you're going to do breeding, you need veterinarian support. And uh, some of those animals will go off to the abattoir and butcher. Um, if more people had to prepare their own meat products, more people would become vegetarians. Right? And, that, and we are moving into something that we are largely vegetarian with the occasional meat product because there's just not going to be enough there. But the reality is, from a nutrition point of view, meat products will allow a healthier community. So there will be a, a series of change in attitudes on both fronts. We've got leather hides, we can make blood and bone fertiliser and meat can be smoked and cured. And all of which would have to be stored and administered by the people who live there. Cooking. This we found was the most difficult problem to deal with. 
This is how cooking was done before um, electricity. It's just like a range hood, a wood stove. But you try and set one of these up in the modern kitchen. I don't know about you, but uh, there's no room for us. And, but if you've got a gas barbecue, you can very quickly establish a kitchen somewhere. And we're talking about things like uh, uh, refit your fireplace or move your kitchen to your garage. Uh, we had power cutouts for four days in Mount Tambourine due to storms. And we did a walk around to see if everyone was okay because there's a lot of retired people who really did depend upon um, regular uh, services and supply. And we found a lot of people were helpless. The power went out, they lost their sewage, they lost their water, uh, but they had solutions in their front yard. They hadn't even considered using them. And, but the number of people who had a gas barbecue, but not a full gas bottle, was amusing the first time we saw it, it was tragic after that. Now, refrigerator. We want to make a fridge. How do we do it? I think an Indian guy came up with this. Take two earthenware pots, both being the same shape but different sizes. So go into your garden, take your wife's favourite plant, tip it out. <laughs> if there's a hole in the bottom, plug it up, put one on the other and fill the space with sand. And put water in with the sand. Place your food items in the inner pot, cover with a lid or a damp cloth, and keep in a dry, well-ventilated area, preferably out of the sun. Thermodynamics will do the rest. Moisture and sand, as the moisture in the sand evaporates, it draws heat away from the inner pot. So it's a way of keeping and preserving food. It's simple, it's robust, it's transportable if you have to, and it doesn't need power. A lot of these solutions are actually also possible for what we've got around us now, providing we think differently. Drinking water. Collect drinking water in a, in a water tank off the roof. And if you don't have one, but you want one quick, refit your swimming pool. Uh, community understanding of what water is and is a, cu a crucial resource. If you start growing fruit and vegetables and use the same drinking water source, you'll find that water goes very quickly unless you manage it carefully. Alternative ways of pumping water that do not need electricity or diesel. And this is very important, you need to get your head around making contaminated water safe. Filter it, distill it, or pressure cook it. What you're doing is you're removing the bacteria load. If people start getting tummy bugs and they're sick, work will stop very quickly. Install water, uh, gravity-fed water tanks on stands, so you don't need pumps to get water out of them. And have a hand pump or a tap outlet. You don't have to buy these things, you can make them. Develop local resources and expertise in maintaining and testing groundwater and develop the idea of grey water recycling systems. You use water in things like your laundry and stuff like that. You shouldn't drink it as such, uh, but you can still use it to do things like grow veggies. Here's a manual water pump. These were all the rage about a century ago. You don't see them anymore because uh, we've got electricity now. It's just a pipe with a bung in it. You can knock one of these up in your garage. But if you do do that, and you've got like a water tank or a water source, you can get your water out without needing power anytime you want, day or night. It's simple, and it's easy to maintain. In areas of water bores, we'll probably see the return of the good old-fashioned windmill. Water filtration. People say, oh, no, no, I can't do that. I've got to buy one of those. On the other hand, you can make one. Layers of sand, gravel, and charcoal, as in burnt wood. It's all it is in a tube. So you could actually pour water at the top and have perfectly safe drinking water out the bottom. Distilling water. Boil it and collect the steam. Simple as that. In areas of, like, say, a cholera epidemic in, say, India, that's what they do. Sewerage. Most people don't like to talk about sewerage, but if you don't get this right, the health problems in your society become a problem very quickly. Understanding how you need to do this and change your behaviour to manage human waste is very, very important. You need local expertise to maintain and repair your old-fashioned septic tanks or composting toilets. Now, people say, oh, we don't have one of those, so make them. It's like any other task, make them. They're not that hard to do. If you need power to run these things, have a standalone power generator that's reliable, like solar panels on batteries or something. 
and develop making spare parts from your locally sourced materials so you don't have to buy them from the local hardware store. And introduction of things like biogas can be considered. These solutions are not for everyone, but these are options to consider. Have someone in your community that makes soap. Very, very important. And also important, if you can't buy, buy toilet paper, what are you going to do about it? People say, oh, let's use a leaf. All right. So now you're going to start flushing leaves down into your compost toilet. Are you going to start to have blockages and plumbing problems? You need to think it through. And if you are going to use a leaf, some leaves are better than others. <laughs> Find out what's better than others and plant that tree now. Yep. And, and uh, you also have to be very careful in terms of, in, in terms of sanitation to of handling that sponge. And that requires education. At the moment, we just press the button and magic happens. Uh, we don't really understand how our sewerage works. We don't have to. But if we did, what would it look like? Here's a diagram of, say, a composting toilet. It's just really like a... Um, uh, it, it's quite simple. And here's like a two-chamber septic tank. They're not that complicated to make. Transport. A shift in attitude from reliance on private motor cars. I scared him off. Uh, back to greater use of walking and cycling. The vehicles that do run will be group shared. Access to good quality shoes. Shoes wear out. Don't have five inch stilettos to walk to the shop in. Because there will be less than optimal conditions. And form a network of people, equipment and products and anything else that needs transporting and get organised. The return of the horse culture and everything that comes with it. And if you can make biodiesel, you could say, have a tradable resource and you could run a couple of trucks and tractors. Horse culture, this is uh, part of my solution. But if you're going to have the horse culture, you've got to look after the horse. Nutrition, what you feed it, a farrier to get the feet done, access to a dentist, a veterinarian every now and then, and the ability to get out there and do daily grooming. But if you're going to uh, uh, shoe the horse, you're going to manufacture the horseshoes, and you need to shape those horseshoes without electricity. Blacksmith. Your property management. You've got to uh, manage your property appropriately to prevent overgrazing. Your infrastructure like stables and sheds. And if you're going to do herd improvement and breeding, you need to contain the stallion. And once you have the horse cared for and you have the property cared for, you've got to work out what you're going to do with it. So you need uh, appropriate infrastructure, you need someone who can actually work with harness and leather work, making saddles, horse-drawn vehicles, etc, etc, etc. Distillation of alcohol. If you can make alcohol from, say, potato scraps, it's very useful for making solvents. For those of you who used to watch MASH, you might recognise what that is. Medical health care. At the moment, if I was to fall off the stage and break my leg, it'd be very simple. You'd, load me, you'd call an ambulance, you'd load me to the ambulance, I'd be trucked off to the nearest hospital and all would be well. But in a post-transition world, we'll have a different set of procedures. You need to think about what that is. Development of medical centres into many hospitals to handle the more serious uh, medical emergencies. Local training for more nurses, midwives and doctors to be dispersed through the community. Local manufacture of medical supplies like bandages and disinfectant. Medical equipment and manufacture has to be completely reinvented. Sterilisation of tools and bandages without electricity has to be looked at. And integration of natural health medicine in with conventional medicine is now a requirement. And growing a herb garden for medicinal purposes and homegrown manufacture of pharmaceuticals is now a tradable resource. You could, make man you could make pharmaceuticals at home. This is what they used to do, and this is what they'll do again. Trade and goods. The whole idea of money may well have to be reinvented and re-looked at. Barter and trade of all goods need to become part of our culture. We need to form a marketplace where people can come together and encourage and support the development of local business that contributes to sustainability and get rid of the businesses that do not. Establish trade with other communities, and to do this, you'd want to become as close to as possible an export-based economy where all our needs are met locally, and develop a transport network to transport goods around the place. Harder than it sounds. This is where I live, Castellan Community Garden. It's an organic farm, no herbicides, but it's also a training centre. 
we think there's going to come a point where more people are going to need to know how to grow food. Right, so we're going to set things up where we're going to start bringing in groups of people, showing what we do, and then helping them get established where they are. The more people that can grow their own food from the first principles there are, the more likely we're going to get through this without tears. And then there's the green shed. The green shed was set up as a marketplace where small growers could bring uh, all the stuff they grew and sell it to the public. It was an exchange point. Money. What does it really do and who for? Revise and restructure the concept of debt. Revise and restructure the concept of ownership. If we're going to have communities and community assets, who actually owns them? And as we're moving into the world of what you see is what you get, we've got to get off this idea of money is numbers on a screen and stuff you can't see. Trust me doesn't come into it. You've got to be able to see it. So we need practical, logistical support for local business to engage in four options. Barter, or some sort of let scheme, or some sort of trade scheme. Purchase of large-scale goods like real estate using gold and silver bullion. We've got to be able to use the existing federally issued fiat currency, Australian dollar. And if and when that crashes, what will the Australian government recommend as a replacement? And we need the authority for the local community to make a legally accepted choice with regard to all of those options above. So technology is uh, it's an empowering thing. So what will our manufacturing uh, process look like? Rare examples of 21st century technology, what you see now, hybrid constructions, Hybrid constructions uh, made from bits around us in ways we've never seen before. 1930s pre-transistor technology, stuff we can make from the stuff around us. We could probably handle the wiring of an electric motor. We probably couldn't make electric circuits and chips. 1880s based technology, which is what we can create from scratch from our surrounding environment. So let's look at that. We want to manufacture stuff, and these are the skills we're going to do it with woodworking, leatherworking, what have you, rubber casting, blacksmith, all of which will need raw materials, which we've got to collect, and we'll do our damnedest recycle from the stuff around us because it's going to be easier. Now, all the stuff down here, like blacksmithing and metal casting, a lot of it comes down to a blast furnace. So we have a blast furnace or a kiln or a forge and bellows, all of which needs raw materials to feed it. Conventionally, we use a workshop with, say, welders in it or power tools, if we're going to do that, we need to support it with electricity and we need a power source to do that. We're also going to start seeing things like water wheels and steam technology in much the way they had like a century ago. Metal work. How do we shape metal without electricity? Well, this is how they used to do it and I can't think of an easy alternative. Blacksmith. A water wheel. We need water and it will flow from one place to the other. This was a way of actually sort of using to power larger scale engineering before we had electricity. Simple to do, we've just got to build it. Now, steam technology is something that was part of our culture about a century ago. And it could become so again, but we've just got to re remember how to do it. Now, a lot of these ideas that I've talked about so far have been geared around the idea of a small country town, a small community. Doing it in this environment is going to be challenging. It can be done, but it requires vision and leadership from our politicians. It requires the people on the ground to understand what is needed and to agree with those politicians. And it requires everyone to work together and the application of technology. And all that stuff, need, the new system needs to be in place before there's any problems whatsoever, which means they should have started 20 years ago. There's no easy answers here. All right, and now we're getting to the last part. An event-based timeline. Here's my model. Three phases. Phase one, warning signs. Relatively normal for the cracks are showing and marker signatures appearing for serious problems to come. Seen by those who choose to look but ignored by everyone else. Characterised by a business's normal attitude. And all these issues that we see Large-scale mainstream media and officialdom deny such things that exist and there's a bit of character assassination on behalf of people who would try and suggest otherwise. System two, uh, phase two, system strain. Serious problems seem global even in a distant fashion. And they start interacting on every front. Multiple fundamental system hubs break down and are hastily patched together. 
We saw that in the GFC. Banks crashed. Banks were bailed out. Banks were papered over. Phase three, systemic breakdown. Systemic failure resulting in the breakdown of societies and vital networks. At the boundary between two and three, the system hubs break down permanently and are characterised by goods that are just either expensive or just unavailable. And basic society functions won't work in spite of the best efforts of governments and corporations. This is what we're going to see as we look out the window. It's simplistic, it's crude, but it might serve. And the longer it takes for society to face these problems, the more serious and far-reaching the consequences Covering up and papering over these problems all but guarantees them blowing out at a later date and a steeper time frame to the worst case scenario. Government and corporate covering these serious issues makes a hard and fast crash into a systemic failure more likely. I'll leave it up to you to decide where we are on that. So, to finish up, we're now looking at across these phases, we've got a series of tasks food production, water collection, what have you. And so, as we go through the phases, it would be nice if you had the following done. Phase one, public awareness. Start getting your skills together with things like canning and preserving, composting. Phase two, establish a marketplace where people can come together. Establish seed saving from someone. Start planting fruit trees. By the time we get to phase three, community warehouses are now agreed upon. Compost fertilizer system stable. The local area is self-sufficient in fruit, vegetables, dairy products, eggs and beef production, sustainably. Water collection, public awareness. Phase two, as many water tanks as possible have standalone powered pumps or manual pumps or both. Several tradespeople know what to do with them. By the time we get to phase three, have uh, uh, water bores and protocols to maintain and repair them. Waste and sewerage. By the time we get to phase two, start having tradesmen who actually know what to do in making the appropriate systems like compost toilets and have a system fundamentally overhauled using parts manufactured uh, locally and have them maintained for a period of time. That's when we get to phase three. That's no way you can do it. Rubbish. Public awareness. Establish a wrecking yard where you can house broken equipment. Here are the old bone yards. If we want all this to keep all this stuff, you've got to start thinking about what you're going to do with it. So instead of throwing it away, we'll throw it away in a place we can get it later. By the time we get to phase three, establish multiple re community recycling centres somewhere where you can process garbage. Health, public awareness is where it starts. Phase two, training and support of midwives, nurses and doctors. Community herbal gardens for medicinal purposes or a practitioner in the community that's, that's well set, enough, set up enough to maintain a lot of people and a network of health practitioners. Phase three, develop the medical centres into um, locally to be able to handle the more serious medical needs and be able to manufacture the disposable products. Energy starts with education. By the time we get to phase two though, start having an idea of biodiesel uh, to make things like windmills or batteries or solar panels. Have someone to think about what to do, how to do it, give it a go. And by the time we get to phase three, some of this stuff is applied. Housing and property, public awareness in phase one, and you start getting together and having working bees. If you want to plant up your backyard, it's a lot of work. But if you've got ten people to turn up to help you on Saturday afternoon and you go help them, it gets done. Phase two, Working bees become a greater urgency and you have some sort of idea that, uh, uh, some sort of metric to say how many properties are self-sufficient. And phase three, the properties that aren't self-sufficient will become so very quickly through necessity. Okay, transport. Public awareness, encourage the purchase of good shoes and bicycles. Develop skills to make horse gear uh, and horse and cart if you want to go that way. Uh, farrier and horseshoeing, a blacksmith if someone could do it. Shoemaking, leather work. By the time we get to phase three, develop the ability to breed and break in horses, manufacture biodiesel, and a network of non-fossil fuel freight transport throughout the local area. Communication. Develop of community-based information resource hubs at the local library at any garden community centre or community markets. Phase out the dependency on the mobile phone network. That's what's going to crash first. Establish local expertise in HF, UHF, ham radio operation so you can communicate with other communities. Develop a means of transport for postal items. At its basic form, someone walking around with a backpack will do the job. 
Establish skills, uh, a library of useful books to contain useful information, and start thinking about how you educate your kids in such an environment. Have people using skills in various crafts and learning products of their labours being used by those, by those people in the community. Business and economy, encourage and support the development of local business and phase out the ones that are not sustainable. Develop a local economy where all your needs are met and establish trade with other communities. Finance, develop of a barter system and encourage people to personally purchase gold and silver. Practical logistical support for barter, purchase of bowl and gold and silver, existing federal currency and its replacement. Manufacture and repair. Encourage the reskilling of local people into useful crafts prevalent between 1880 and 1945. And encourage those people to acquire, make and buy the necessary tools to apply their craft. Phase three, get to the point where you start looking at metal furnaces, blast furnaces and steam technology. And establish a chemical laboratory that makes useful items. Community, have an idea of what, who or where your community might look like. You don't have to tell anyone about it, but you can start thinking about it. And if that community is in place already, start getting that community to work together. <coughs> now, our household. How do we make it resilient to change? At the moment, you have these systems. Drinking water comes from centralised water supply. Transport comes from a petrol uh, car or public transport. Sewerage is centralised. Cooking comes off the main power electric stove. And so does the fridge. So does your lights. We buy food from the supermarket and we get medication from the pharmacist. Uh, we generally have, say, 10 days uh, food in the, in the cupboard associated with one pay cycle. Our communication is based on, say, a computer and a mobile phone. What happens if we start having rolling blackouts? Well, the first thing we lose is delicate electronics. Computers and mobile network will just crash. Anything that's attached to the main power grid will just stop working. So you've got to start thinking about what you're going to do. Uh, refrigerator, you can make an earthenware pot system or a Calgary fridge. Lighting, candles or an oil lantern. Washing machine, wash in a bucket. Cooking, gas barbecue. Communications, an old fashioned landline telephone that you plug in the wall. You often find them at the garage sales, no one wants them anymore. So what happens um, if you can't buy food anymore? Your, your uh, supermarket just doesn't work for a while. That's where you have your general stores. Have a couple of months of food in your cupboard. Things like toiletries and sanitation, sanitation pads, that sort of thing. If you need this stuff, have it in place. Medication's got to be part of your stores too. Petrol. Transport. If that breaks down, what do you do? Well, walk. Use a bicycle. Stuff that you've got around you now. Drinking water. If we lose drinking water, you tend to, if you lose water and your sewerage will often go at the same time. For a while, you can flush your toilet with a bucket of water if you can get water some other way. And if you have water in a water tank, you can manage your own water supply. And if you have a bucket and a rope and boil your drinking water, you can actually start looking at what to do. Sewerage system. Uh, if you have one of those camping portable toilets, that'll buy you a couple of weeks. Otherwise, you're faced with digging a hole in the back garden. But if you have a bucket of water, you can flush your existing toilet. But that centralised toilet system will back up eventually. Food. The supermarket goes offline for weeks at a time now. You can't buy stuff anymore and you can't get your medication. Grow your own food. Medication though. This is, the, this is a tough one. If you're on pharmaceutical medication, consider developing alternatives. This will require thought, it will require training, and it will require time. Now, the world we live in now is backwards and out of balance. And you need to make a new one anyway. So while some of the things we're looking at is decidedly unpleasant, most of it's necessary. So that's the talk. That's where we end.